Okay, good morning. I want to begin with a confession. Much of the time when we talk about Mennonite history, it's as if we're all part of one lineage that goes back to January of 1525 in Zurich. Many of us in this room are from that Swiss Mennonite tradition, but there are other traditions, there are other streams, and we're going to talk about the Mennonite, or the Russian Mennonite stream today. But we could equally talk about people who speak Amharic who are part of the Ethiopian Mennonite story, or we could talk about the East African Swahili story, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are many Mennonite stories, and they're all part of the Mennonite peoplehood. Sometimes we tend to narrowly look at our own group as if they're the only group. Um, when I was in graduate school, I went to the Boston Mennonite Fellowship, which included mostly people who were in school at Boston University, like I was, or at Harvard University. Gordon Kaufman was a theologian at Harvard at the time, and we used to talk about the Elkhart Goshen mentality. Well, it was this inclusive Swiss Mennonite identity that excluded people like him who come from the Russian Mennonite background. So this morning, I want to talk about that Russian Mennonite story. The Russian story really begins in Holland. As early as 1530, Mennonites began to leave Holland because of the persecution they were suffering there and went east. They went first to Germany, to northern Germany. Why did they go there? Well, northern Germany was, there was a lot of swampland there. And the Mennonites in, in Holland knew how to create dikes, knew how to use windmills to suck the water out of the ground, make the ground uh, tillable. They went to Germany for that reason first, and then moved over into Prussia for the same reason. They used their skills to make swampland turned into uh, arable land. Nobility took them in in Germany. Nobility would later take them in in Prussia as well. There were consequences. They had to pay an annual tax to live in northern Germany. And they were protected because of the benefits they brought, the financial economic benefits they brought. So they started out here moved over into northern Germany. And in a moment, I'll say that this is where Menno Simons came from, and that's where he ended his life. Excuse me, not, not where he came from, but where he ended his life. Uh, Menno Simons had to flee, like many people, from Holland because of persecution. He ended his life as a printer, as a writer, um, the area that he lived in was eventually destroyed by the Thirty Years' War. Today, if you go to that area, there is a museum there, Menokat, which is between Hamburg and Lübeck. There is a museum. There is that linden tree there and his tombstone. Here lived and taught um, and died, Menno Simons, in humility, tranquility, and piety. Well, the Mennonites left northern Germany because of continued persecution. As early as 1562, they were invited to go to what is now Poland, again, in the swamps. There were as many as 12,000 Mennonites in what is now Poland, the Prussian territory. They were allowed to live there because of the economic benefits they gave to the country, to the area, but they were subject to special laws, special taxes. Only men were allowed to serve in, only men who served in the Prussian army could own land. The men couldn't own land unless their men went into the military. Uh, country subjectors had to pay a tax, had to pay special fees. Or other regulations that they didn't like. Which, this is the area, by the way, that is Gdansk or Danzig, and this is the Vistula area of 
Russia, Poland, where those people live. It's in Poland that they encounter the delegation from Catherine the Great. Poland is a place that they wanted to live. It's a place that, well, I'll go on to the next point. It's in Poland and Prussia that the language of the Russian Mennonites evolved, Plautich. Plautich is a, connection, a combination of Dutch and Prussian German that the Russian Mennonites have preserved to this day. So we have at least three languages by this point, Pennsylvania Dutch language, Latinate, the Hutterish language that comes from Central Germany and the Tyrol and Austria. Later, there's a 19th century Amish migration to this country, which brings a Swiss dialect of German, which is distinctly different. So there are at least four German languages that come out of these migrations. Of course, there are many others since then. Well, it's in Poland that Catherine the Great sends a delegation to meet the Mennonites after hearing that they were people with skills that might be used in the Ukraine. Uh, the emissary from Poland, excuse me, when Catherine came to Poland in 1786, he was received warmly because he said, if you come to Russia, you will have a special status. Emissary went back and told Catherine, hey, these are good people. You ought to get them down to Ukraine. In March of 1788, a special chart, special set of privileges were given to these potential migrants. The Russian government said, if you come, we'll allow you to live separate from the rest of the population. That was fine with them. They liked the idea of being separate. They were given special permission to brew vinegar, beer, and still brandy. They were famous for their brandy. These special rights were known as the privilegium, special rights granted to Mennonites. Eight families left Russia in March of 1788, going to Russia. They didn't get there until almost a year later. The first Russian Mennonite settlement was formed on the banks of the Kokitsa River, and that is known to this day as the Old Colony. The second Russian Mennonite establishment was on the Lechna River, Lechna Settlement. And there were two others that came later, the Antioch and Alexander. The Lechna was the more prosperous, progressive of the two. Here's a map of current Ukraine, and the old colony, the Kitsa, is right there near the Nipro. The Lechna settlement is near Zaporizhia. Zaporizhia we hear about almost every day in the news because that's where that nuclear power plant is that's being bombed continuously by the Russians. So these areas where Mennonites lived, and some still live, is very much talked about all the time these days. Well, so the Mennonites created these little islands, in the cultural islands. They had their own government had their own leaders. Each village had a mayor or a magistrate that oversold, oversaw the whole village. Each village had its own school, its own roads, its own facilities for the poor. They created their own little uh, parliaments, their own penal code. The Mennonites functioned as a democratic state enjoying freedom with their Russian time. Um, they developed hospitals, mental hospitals, schools for the deaf, and so on and so forth. They were self-sufficient by and large. They were able to minimize their contact with the Russian society. But by 1870, they were particularly disturbed by the possibility of being conscripted, not being exempt from military service, and the possibility that it could be used in the German language, particularly in their schools. They sent a delegation to St. Petersburg to meet with the Tsar to appeal for ongoing privileges, particularly privileges not participating in the military. 
They didn't get to actually meet the Tsar. They met with high officials. They made a request to non-combatants in military service. Well, the most conscientious of Mennonites couldn't accept any form of service that supported making war. And so they began to say, we need to leave the they sent a delegation to North America in 1872. And a year later, a large group of Russian Mennonites and Hutterites left the Ukraine. The Russian government wasn't happy losing these people, these good farmers, people with special skills. And they said, OK, um, we'll back off a little bit. And in 1875, after the initial group had left, they granted special status in the military. Mennonites. They said if you join the military, you have to work in forest fire prevention or something to do with ocean work. Uh, and they even said if you come and join the army, we'll allow you to have your men separated from the rest of the other people in the military and have your own resources. Well, things went okay until the First World War came along. And German-speaking people everywhere were suspect, here as well as in Russia. Because they were successful in business, they, they were suspect. And when the Russian Revolution came along, they were considered to be bourgeoisie, they were part of the elite. And then, as you know, they had this awful experience of being raided by what I would call terrorists. This man by the name of Mucknow was, as a young man, probably worked for a Mennonite colony, Mennonite farmers. Later in life, committed crimes, was imprisoned in Siberia, escaped prison in Siberia, went back to Ukraine, and did some awful, awful things to the Mennonites there. Burned buildings, raped women, etc. For a period of time, the, time, the Mennonites created their own self-defense groups called it the Selbstschutz. And there were actually men patrolling the colonies at night with guns. After this period was over, there was a lot of soul searching about that period when they resorted to the potential of violence. That era was very, very difficult. There was a terrible famine in Russia in the 20s. In the summer of 1924, representatives from the Lecture Colony went to North America to plead the United States help us get through this difficult time. And it's that point at which Mennonite Central Committee was organized. Mennonite Central Committee originated with the need to do something about these poor, starving Mennonites in the as you know, three Goshen College students were sent to Ukraine in the middle of the Civil War. They were sent to find out what the needs are, how North American Mennonites could help the Russian Mennonites. Two of them returned. One of them went into war territory, but in fact, disappeared with never heard of it. Several thousand Mennonites died during the Great Famine Revolution. So there was a steady flow of Mennonites out of Ukraine beginning in that period, coming to the U.S. and Canada initially and later to South America. NTC, as I said, was originally designed to help with this famine from 1920 to 1925. There was a lot of work in Russian refugee assistance. It stopped in 1925. In 1930, NTC began again to assist refugees fleeing Russia, waiting for a new, they were in Germany, waiting for a new home, and many of those made their way to Germany. I've mentioned this in the um, Three smaller groups emerged from the Russian Mennonite population, the so called Kleine Gemeinde, uh, literally a small community, a small group of people. Their leader was a Weimar. He came from Prussia to Ukraine. He was unhappy with the Mennonite colony of Malachna. He said they cooperated too much with local authorities. They turned over lawbreakers to the local authorities. They were too lax in disciplining members who used alcohol. 
in life, the attendance at weddings and the flower eulogies, which is all in the client of the mind uh, left Russia in the 1880s, most ended up in Latin America. Today, there are about 5,000 of them, 2,000 in Mexico and Bolivia, at least. Many of them joined the Holdemans. I talked about the Holdemans last week. Um, so, long ago, you were asking me about the Holdemans in Kansas. Many of the client of the mind of people ended up with those Holdemans in Kansas. That's the first group. Second group is the old colony. I said that the first Russian settlement in Russian Mennonite settlement was at Kohitsa. And that's the old colony. Among the most conservative people in that group in the old colony were a subgroup who wanted to be more separate from the world, more separate even from their Russian Mennonite counterparts. Um, when the Russian and later Canadian government began to push public education, that troubled them, so they moved. The old colony Mennonites came to Canada first, and then to Latin America, and now are primarily in Latin America. Here's a quote from a current old colony person. I am an old colony Mennonite. My church teaches me that it's important to be there for my fellow Mennonite brothers and sisters, but also that the Bible teaches me to remain separate from the world. One other foundational belief that I have is that my faith must be lived out in everyday life. That's why I choose to live a lifestyle that's different from those around me, and why I'm sometimes wary of a lifestyle that's seemingly associated with worldly life. What characterizes the old Mennonites? Well, in a word, it's tradition. I know Amish people who try to help old colony people. They've had financial difficulty, they difficulties with agriculture. Uh, one man from northern Indiana who went to Mexico to help with dairy farmers there said, I just can't work with those people. They're so backward in tradition. This is an old order Amish person talking about old colony people. Um, his example was on Sunday mornings when the old colony preacher preaches, he always wears uh, boots up to his knees. Why? Because in Russia, they wear boots up to their knees. In the old colony is still learning. Um, so it's a very traditional group of people who've had different. Um, you can't see it very well, but on the right, those are old colony women in a market in Bolivia. Look how Russian they look, or how different they look than Bolivian kind of parts. Men do not have beards. They carry these, some of these uh, clothing distinctives from the Russian days. A couple of weeks ago, there was this picture in the Anabaptist world of a old colony family in Central America. A lot of them have really had difficult lives, and they're not very well off. But they have celebrated their centennial. First went to Mexico in 1922, and last year, or this year rather, they had a big celebration of their coming to Mexico. The fire and the chief that we celebrate our history. The Mexican government created a poem, a peso, 100 years of the arrival of the Mennonites in Mexico. Coin has a picture of an old colony family on one side and the United States of Mexico. So, obviously, the Mexican government has seen some benefit of having new people in there. Um, in 2016, a group of New Order Amish went to Bolivia and Argentina to try to help old colony people there. Um, the old colony were having difficulties, they wrote a letter to Pathway Publishing in Ontario. You know, there's an old order publishing company in Elmer, Ontario, they publish books, uh, free periodicals, family life, young people, and another one for teachers. Well, they wrote a letter and said, please, somebody help us. And the letter was published broadly in the Pathway publication, and a group of New Order Amish in Ohio said, we're going to go help. And the new order allows people to fly on airplanes. Strict old order people will not fly on airplanes. So they got on planes, went to South America, 
and began to help this, these old colony people. He initially sent two families. Um, these are someone else's words, not mine. North American Amish generally do not proselytize, evangelize, or do mission work, but they thought this was a way of helping people in, in the way they know best. And here's a quote from Steve Nolte about this unusual female to historian colleague of mine, now at Elizabeth College. This is kind of a new and different thing. It illustrates an unusually, even among the new order, approach to taking in new members. Mennonite men in these areas have begun to grow beards, Amish style beards, and an Ohio woman has begun to make bonnets for them head coverings that are closer to the Amish head covering or the Russian people. Um, the third group is the biggest group and probably the most important group of the three of the men In the 19th century in Ukraine, there was a kind of spiritual awakening, particularly in the Malachian colony. Uh, there was a group that had come from Prussia who settled in the Malachian colony who were impacted by pietism, we talked about pietism last time. They had had some contact with Moravians as well. They had a strong commitment to conversion to mission work. This group from the Malachia colony called a Lutheran preacher, a linguist, to their colony, who was very evangelical, who organized annual mission festivals. Those who met with Rust eventually became known as the Rus died in 1859. The brethren held communion with no minister present. In 1860, they filed a document with the Russian government saying, we want the same privileges as the rest of the Mennonites, but we want to be separate. They accused, they accused the larger group of being corrupt of its leaders tolerating the condition of spiritual decay. The main group said, mm, we don't like this. In fact, they took, as I say here, a strange course of action for Anabaptists. Instead of calling church leaders together to discuss the accusations against them, they asked the civil authorities to do an investigation. Colony administration invoked Article 362 of the Colony Penal Code, which included secret societies, accused, accused the brethren of being a secret society. Religious meetings not sponsored by the established church of the So there's a big rift between what became the men of the brethren and the other men. Issues continued to get worse when the brethren tried to organize their own church. They went to St. Petersburg, asked for privileges. Main body of Mennonites said to the government, don't give them those privileges. They declared the brethren is no longer Mennonite, but a sect, a new sect. Uh, the Russian government eventually gave its blessing in 1864, but this bitter tension between the main body of Mennonites and the Mennonite brethren was sufficiently large that the Mennonite brethren began to leave. There was a large migration of Mennonite brethren from Canada, to Canada and eventually to Kansas and Nebraska in the 1870s. The Mennonite brethren emphasized baptism by ocean. The early leaders read Menno Simon's writing, noticed that he said the original mode of baptism, Jesus was baptized in Jordan, so therefore immersion is the original mode of baptism. Uh, baptism by pouring is not the original mode. Baptism by immersion became a prerequisite for membership. By 1900, there were 2,000 MDs in North America. Currently, there are about almost a half a million brethren in the world, with many of them in Africa. Congo has huge numbers of men. Mennonite brethren were dominant in the churches in Brazil, Paraguay, and rushing because I wanted to get to a point where we have several people from the Russian Mennonite tradition here. And I'm wondering if this resonates with your story, your experience. 
Uh, yes, I was raised Mennonite Brethren and from a long history of Mennonite Brethren uh, people. Um, and uh, what resonated with me was the, the feelings of which persisted un, until at least my childhood. Um, we, we really thought we were better even than other Mennonites which um, I, in, in thinking about this, I, I think this is characteristic of renewal movements. I sensed this during the charismatic renewal. Um, people had found new, new life, um, and the rest of us um, were still kind of in darkness, and, and, and we, should, you know, we should also be having the same experiences, et cetera. So I think it's sort of part of that part of that mentality. But yeah, I mean, we, and I, I regret it to this day. And this didn't come so much from my family. And it was never stated. <laughs> it was just something that we got by osmosis. Um, and, and so that, yeah, that for sure. And it could probably apply to other groups too. <laughs> This is Marvin. I don't know if I can resonate with any of the teaching, but I do know that my mother's family immigrated to Salt Lake, Minnesota in about 1878. Um, heard some stories about, uh, know that there was tension, or totally understand it between the Mennonite brothers and the general conference Mennonites that originated from Russia. I don't think it exists today, but it did during my childhood. You can definitely uh, identify with the idea that baptism by immersion was the uh, method of the Lord God by God. Lord God. I do appreciate the symbolism. Anybody else have a comment? Um, however, I do appreciate the I I do appreciate the emphasis on conversion. <laughs> and of making a decision to follow Jesus, a conscious decision. And that was even though there were abuses. <laughs> um, but um, I, I, I do feel that, I do feel that that's important, um, even though it was kind of maybe carried to an extreme. Um, but, and also the emphasis on evangelism and missions. And that's why there are so many Mennonite brethren in Africa is because the um, because of the missions movement uh, among the Mennonite brethren. In an earlier conversation with you, um, we talked about some of us having the tendency to talk about doing church when we got baptized. That this tradition that Benny represents talks more about conversion. Individual being converted as opposed to the individual joining the church. Either is better, or just two different ways of thinking about it. Anybody else? This is Marlon Logan. I've had the privilege of getting to know the Mennonites in South America. Uh, the Mennonite Brethren, uh, the ones in Brazil, the ones in Uruguay, the ones in Paraguay. But back to Brazil, uh, we did have the Russian Mennonites, we had the Holderman Mennonites. Uh, they're all distinct. We could talk hours about it. Uh, but I, I really, uh, I've enjoyed this very much. And uh, I can connect that. Those old Mennonites in Santa Cruz, 
They go down the street, the men are walking ahead, and then comes wife, two steps back, and then a whole string of kids. And that's exactly the way they're dressed. And I don't know why, but the men always wear cowboy hats. That's, that's part of it. And I think the Mexicans do too. Our time is up. Uh, I've enjoyed this seven week journey with all of you. And...